Um, tonight, we are celebrating the second session of the series of book presentation, Catalan for Independence Explained Abroad, that Catalan National Assembly in Switzerland has organized around the cultural events happening for the celebration of St. George on the 23rd of April. This event is being live streamed on our YouTube channel where the chat is open for questions that will be collected for the questions and answers section at the end of this presentation. Tonight, we present the book, The Case of the Catalans, edited by the member of the European Parliament and Minister of Education of Catalonia in exile, Clara Ponsati. Madame Ponsati is a Catalan economist specialized in game theory and political economy with a focus on models of bargaining and voting. Previously to become Minister of Catalonia, she was the director of the School of Economics and Finance at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, positions she resumed after the events of October 2017 and her, and her forced exile. Welcome, Madame Ponsati. Thank you for accepting this invitation. It is a, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So could you explain us what are the origins of the book? Why did you decide to publish a new version of the case of the Catalans? Uh, well, it's not a new version. It's the first issue, but it's true that the, na the, the title had been used uh, before. Uh, I, this, is, this is a book that appeared uh, quite recently, uh, a few months ago, but uh, that has been in the making since uh, 2016 when I was uh, an academic at St. Andrews. I was uh, an involved uh, citizen, Catalan citizen and, you know, uh, a supporter of the independence project, but I was not uh, involved in politics. Uh, but as an academic uh, abroad, I found myself in many occasions in which I discussed what was going on in Catalonia and many, you know, I always like to give uh, my students or my friends and colleagues a reading list and I, did, I checked to see what I could recommend people that didn't know about uh, Catalonia. And I found that there was no uh, book that explained the present uh, Catalan situation in a concise and understandable way for the international uh, reader. So that's why I, uh, you know, I started talking to some friends, some other acad uh, Catalan acad academics, uh, about that and you know I always uh, my suggestion at the beginning was why don't you write a book and I, you know I approached a number of people uh, telling them to write that book and none of them quite took the challenge but a number of them were willing to share the burden and that's how we you know this project started as a collective project and then it took uh, quite a long time uh, among other things because I was uh, uh, you know, distracted by other activities because I became a member of the Puigdemont government in the summer of 2017. And uh, the book was sort of halfway through when that happened. Uh, and it did not, uh, we completed the full uh, draft of the book in the summer of 2018 or maybe the maybe beginning of 2019 but and then you know uh, when everything was ready the pandemic hit so there were you know subsequent delays but eventually we have the book uh, it's a book that it's probably in its content slightly outdated because many things have ha have happened since uh, we finished it but I think that in terms of the main goal of the book which was to explain why Catalans want to be independent, the arguments why we wanted to be independent in 2016 and the arguments why we want to be independent in 2021, I think they are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, you know, the grievances uh, that uh, cause, that are the cause behind uh, our cause are even stronger. So I think that the book is still useful uh, the way it is. 
Okay, so um, as you said, um, this is a this is a collective work um, combining contributions of seven different Catalan academics. Um, how was this particular group of authors defined? Did you choose them as editor, or was a collaboration that was existing already before? Uh, well, I, I mean, uh, honestly, I don't recall the exact. Uh process by which the group was formed. I first uh, talked to uh, Car probably to Carlos Bosch and Enriqueta Aragonés, who were, who were my friends and colleagues, both of them, with whom I talked a lot. And, and then, you know, we said, well, we need a historian. And then, you know, somebody came up with the name of Carreras. He was uh, very enthusiastic uh, from the beginning. And then, you know, Bo said, well, I cannot write this. My, why don't we ask that? And then Enriqueta and Jordi uh, Muñoz had worked together on similar topics. And so they, it was natural for them to write the chapter on, uh, uh, on the electoral politics of the, of the, of the process. And so, uh, so that's how we, or, you know, it was a sort of a very natural way. At the beginning, I wasn't really doing much <laughs> other than being the promoter. <laughs> and so my chapter was actually the, the last to be written. Uh, and um, I, you know, I used the materials of everybody else as sort of, you know, in some, 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 in a way I, wa I was free writing. And then, you know, then it's true that I, act, you know, as the editor, I did a lot of uh, editing. Uh, and, you know, making things coherent and, you know, these sort of things. And, you know, mostly uh, an editor is someone who uh, goes after the authors to, so, that, so that the work gets done. And that's, uh, that's what eventually I did when I was back at St. Andrews in 2018 and 19, uh, when I was back at my real profession as an academic for, a, I don't know, a, a, a little bit more than a year before I, I came to this, uh, to the European Parliament in my uh, political hat. Uh, should I describe the chapters or do you want to, sorry, I don't want to, you know, interfere to your questions, but I can have a brief description of, uh, yeah, of I the think chapters. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yep. I mean, first, as I mentioned, the, 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 my, my first chapter is sort of an introduction uh, that contextualizes the main issues at contention. And, you know, I discuss uh, what are the problems with the constitution, uh, the, the democratic constitution of Spain, which is the main question that people, that, you know, that Democrats across the world uh, ask, uh, you know, they come to me or they say, wait, Clara, why do you want to be independent? Spain is a, you know, it's a democratic country. It's, uh, it's sunny and people are very, nice, uh, what's wrong with you, right? So my, my first uh, chapter tries to address what are the issues uh, with this uh, Spanish democracy, and it goes uh, to the roots of the Spanish uh, constitution, what are the problems, what are the problems that uh, were not very visible, but now are very, very crudely visible with the transition from Francoism to democracy in Spain. The second chapter is an introductory uh, historical overview, which I think is, you know, it's excellent because it's very brief, but uh, very, you know, uh, to the point and describes the basic uh, historical uh, foundations of uh, Catalans as a nation, uh, which is something that uh, is important to remind people or to tell people so people don't need to be reminded because they simply don't know that we are a nation of uh, you know of long origin and long tradition that we had our institutions and that those were taken away by force uh, that we've never chosen to be Spaniards and it's important you know to review the history of this non-choice that we are Spanish by war imposition. And that's important to remind people or to uh, illustrate people. And then the third chapter reviews the, the constitutional 
uh, discussions regarding decentralization and devolution in Spain, uh, you know, the whole sad story of the Estatut uh, uh, revision uh, that started in 2005 and uh, ended in 2010 with the decision of the Constitutional Court to dismiss the reform of the Catalan Institute that most of the analysts, I, I, I subscribe to that view, uh, set as the date in which Catalans sort of, or a, a great uh, fraction of the Catalan uh, citizens realized that uh, the regime of autonomy that was given through the constitution of 1978 had reached a end, and that's how, that's why the uh, the demand of independence became uh, a massive uh, demand in the Catalan electorate. Uh, then there is this chapter by Enrique Aragonés and Jordi Muñoz, who are two political scientists. Uh, that review how the opinions and how the par political parties have been changing and adapting to this uh, to the independence agenda, how the, the influence of the grassroots movements into the political parties, how this has changed the uh, composition of the Catalan Parliament. So it's a very uh, thorough analysis of the elector electoral politics in Catalonia and the issue of independence. Then there is a chapter by Xavier Quadras Murató that looks at the economic costs and benefits of Catalan independence that is, uh, identifies what are the uh, uh, economic costs of being in Spain for Catalans, what would be the potential benefits of not depending on Spain, but it also addresses the issue of the potential transition costs. It's, uh, I think it's a very honest uh, Appraisal is extremely, um, I would say, detached in a way that uh, uh, it's not, you know, it doesn't even, it, it's almost not taking a, a side. Uh, that it's, but it's a very cool in both senses uh, chapter. And then finally, there is a chapter by Carlos Bosch uh, on the right of self-determination. It reviews the, the doctrines of self-determination and addresses uh, how uh, our self-determination can adjust to international law in the 21st century. And it's, uh, it's a theoretical um, discussion, but it at the same time reviews the relevant cases of the decision on Kosovo, the the ruling of the Canadian uh, Supreme Court and addresses, uh, it also covers a Swiss topic, which we find it very, very interesting, uh, which is the issue of the creation of the Jura uh, Canton and which recently has had some, uh, some new uh, uh, addition or is in the process of uh, having, uh, you know more about that than I do, but you know, it's also, uh, it's also another case in which self-determination managed democratically uh, is something that uh, can work. And these are all examples that uh, we should uh, rely on. So this is the, an overview of the book. Uh. Thank you. Thank you very much for the summary of the six chapters. Um, as you were saying at the beginning, um, the final publication of the book was delayed to the global coronavirus pandemic crisis. Um, some of the data in the essays may be a bit outdated. Mm -hmm. um, what else, if there is, would you have included in your, if your initial publication date uh, were to, end, to be the end of the 2020 from the very beginning? Would it be something to add there? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would have, I think that my arguments about how the Spanish democracy has which is the image, that's the title of my uh, chapter. I think that we have a lot more evidence right now than we had uh, in 2016 and 17, even even on the uh, 19. I mean, I, I, uh, this book went to print after the Supreme Court issued their uh, conviction of the Catalan government and the Jordis. So this is there. 
Uh, but the evidence of the Constitutional Court not acting as a, as a neutral referee, the evidence of institutions that are acting as uh, uh, institutions of a failed state, like the police or you know the, some parts of the judiciary, the Guardia Civil. So there is a ton more of evidence right now that uh, I would, if I really wrote the book right now, I would include that. Uh, that uh, may be part of the, PT politics of the in say, internal discussions in the Catalan uh, independentist uh, side. Uh, I don't think those are relevant in any way. So, uh, you know, there's been accidents. And also there's been changes in the Spanish side. Uh, this book uh, was, we, I mean, the, the referendum was, under the popular party Rajoy government. When this book was being going to print uh, Sanchez and his dialogue, uh, <laughs> dialogue, many quotes, agenda was sort of beginning uh, in, the, in the Spanish government. Now we have uh, also had evidence of something that we all, that we Catalans all should know, maybe not all of us know, but we all should know that there is no difference uh, whether they call themselves left or right, socialist or popular, when it comes to addressing the Catalan issue, uh, the approach is very much the same. So we've seen uh, how they've uh, played with the political prisoners. They have sort of used uh, them as hostages. They have tortured their families, you know, letting them in and out and uh, uh, abusing in a very, uh, manipulative uh, political way um, and that has had an effect unfortunately uh, but uh, I don't think that's all this is um, relevant but it's, it's true that it's relevant that we can explain to the international audience that it was not a problem that Spain had a right-wing government and now things will be fixed because now it has a left-wing government things are uh, equally problematic and it's important that uh, people uh, across the world know that as well. Yeah. Um, relating to this change of government that's that's happened in Spain, um, would you have like a bit also related to the last question? Would you have added uh, to this book also uh, the centralization of the pandemic crisis management uh, done by the Spanish government? Do you think that's an important fact? That's a very good point. I think that the pandemic has um, exposed in a very raw manner uh, the failures of Sp the institutional failures of Spain. Uh, of course, the pandemic uh, has been a challenge to all kinds of governments, and it's very hard to right now uh, to assess what governments have managed it better or worse. And, you know, it will take uh, the end of the pandemic and uh, careful work, uh, work with the data to assess that. But I dare to say that we will see uh, that in Spain, the mismanagement has been especially uh, notable. Uh, it was very, very obvious at the beginning of the pandemic when you know they uh, <laughs> they approached it uh, in a you know military way, where then when they you know the obvious things that the Catalan president Mr. Torra was asking uh, to do um, uh, to happen, like you know keep, keep people in, don't let people from Madrid go all over the place, you know these very obvious things that everybody has done later on that even the Spanish government has uh, implemented in, in spite of the rebellion that they have in Madrid. There they have a rebellion, but there is no problem with rebellion in Madrid. Uh, so all these things are very, very clear evidence that the institutional, the institutional uh, arrangement in Spain are, you know, are not working. You know, in a, when you have problems, 
in a family, if the family is not structured, an accident, an illness, whatever, you know, in a disease, in a disease structured family, this makes the problems much bigger. You know, the children suffer more, the illness is longer. And, you know, the, the pandemics in Spain is, is a, you know, the parable that I use to understand what's going on is one of a destructured family. And, you know, a destructured family needs to divorce, uh, you know, start over, you know, and that's, uh, that's what's going on in Spain as well. Also, still related to, to the same question, um, I know maybe this is, this has happened too recently to be included in the book. Uh, but would you include new approaches now that the 52% of the voters of Catalonia have elected for independence parties? Well, I mean, the book doesn't include uh, strategic advice in any way. The book is a book to tell people why we want to be independent. It, it's not a book to tell uh Catalans how to be independent and it's not a book to tell the international community how to manage with Catalans once they eventually decide to be independent which unfortunately for my taste still hasn't happened uh you know Catalans uh, organized a sort of self-organized an independence referendum but that was it there was nothing else Uh, so we Catalans, I mean, have this historic habit of proclaiming rep Catalan republics that have uh, very, very short lives, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, so in this sense, I don't think it's, it's especially, you know, it, it doesn't link to the book. I can have my opinion about the value of having a you know, an election in which more than 50% of the electorate supports independence. Of course, that's valuable. Uh, that's the ground that uh, Scotland will be using if they do have the support. I mean, the agenda of the Scottish National Party for the upcoming election in a, in a few days is an, in an, agenda, an agenda based on, well, if we get a majority, we feel that we will have a mandate to uh, have another Scottish uh, referendum of independence. And that's something that everybody can understand in the world. Uh, so uh, right now, uh, it's true that the Catalan parliament has a majority of parties that have independence in their wish list, but it's in the wish list. It's not in the political agenda. And there is a big difference between a wish and a political agenda. So at this point, yes, a majority of the Catalan electorate has voted parties that wish independence. But that has not uh, put independence in the political agenda. The political agendas usually are something that, uh, you know, whoever governs plans to do. And there is no talk of that uh, whatsoever uh, right now in Catalonia. So. Um, when trying to, to explain the why Catalans want to be independent, um, part of the international audience sees the Catalan independence movement as a result of the last economic crisis. It is hard to explain that the Spanish state continued diminishment actions uh, of Catalan politics and self-government already starting already in the 90s uh, are a key factor to it. Uh, what is the best approach to refute this false claim that the movement roots are economically driven only? Okay, that's, that's a chapter, <laughs> that's chapter, let me say, <laughs> that's chapter four. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there was a temporal coincidence, uh, you know, the crisis, the 2008 crisis, Uh, was right before the Constitutional Court ruled that Catalans have no, you know, their statute was uh, nothing to be respected because it was uh, not in according to the Spanish Constitution. Uh, but all the, and there might have been some connections, the insatisfaction of the Catalan people at the time of the crisis, which was extremely deep, 
uh, and the frustration of the incapability to manage uh, that crisis has probably, you know, been part of the uh, mental process or the collective mental process by which we have reached the conclusion that there is no way we can, you know, afford to be, you know, to live uh, a decent life in Spain. That's possible, but if it was just an insatisfaction caused by the economic crisis, well, then that would have been the souffle that, you know, at the beginning, the Spanish opinion would say, well, this is a souffle, it will go. It hasn't gone. It hasn't gone. It's still there. Now we're in the next economic crisis. And this one is going to be very, very deep. You know, people, a lot of people are suffering a lot and it's, it's going to be very, very hard to manage the, you know, the exit of this uh, crisis. Uh, but, uh, you know, our, our feeling that we need to govern ourselves and that only if we govern ourselves, we can try to get over, you know, there is never guarantees, but and that we can try to really promote uh, uh, progress and, you know, social policies and really have a government that works for us, not against us. Uh, that uh, is sort of, you know, it's part of, it's like the gravity law of the Catalan politics. This is not something that, you know, it depends on the weather. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's gravity, it's not the weather. Um, as, as you define, this book is a, is a way to, this goal, the goal of the book is to explain why the, Catalan, why the Catalans want to become independent. Would you think this book is able to change the opinion of a new states or separatism skeptical audience? I don't know. Uh, I think that I, this book gives reasons to someone who looks at us with an open mind and that needs information to make up their own minds. I think that once we get people to listen to us, if they are not biased against that for, you know, some people, you know, like, uh, you know, they are especially uh, fond of Spain and the king and bullfighting and sangria and, you know, they think that it's, uh, that's wonderful and it's stupid to give this up. Okay, fine. If you if that's your position. Uh, so, and, and, we, and on the other hand, it's not, I don't think it's our job to convince anybody. I think that our job is to explain ourselves. And as long as we find a democratic uh, audience on the other side, if there are arguments, and there are democratic procedures, then it's a matter of each people to self-determine. It's, you know, if uh, ne neither Swiss nor French nor Swedes need to have an opinion about whether Catalans should, have in, should be independent or not. So if they want, they can have it, that's okay. But I don't have an opinion about, let me be extreme here, I, I have feelings about Scotland because I am half Scot, but I could, you know, if you pressure me, do you have an opinion like the one I have about Catalonia? No, I see the arguments of one side and the other. If I had, if I had the right to vote, I would, uh, I would have uh, my view. Uh, but, you know, for people that look at it from the outside, it's just a matter of understanding. And once it happens of uh, you know, participating in the structuring of this in the international politics in a way that is compatible with human rights and democracy. That's it. Um, so all we need to do at this point is to explain that our demands are perfectly legitimate political demands that some people like one way or another in politics, but all uh, democratic and peaceful uh, proposals are respectable. I was totally against Brexit, totally. I 
I was there when, when the vote happened. I, I was appalled that the majority of the British people voted that. But hey, they voted it. And you know, there is no discussion about the right of Brits to Brexit. There is no discussion about that. Of course not. We may have ideas of how well off or worse off they will be, but there is no discussion. And I don't think there should be a discussion about the right, our right to self-determination, but there is. And therefore, uh, this book tries to help in having that discussion, which is not a discussion about whether it's good or bad for the world that there is a country called Catalonia in the United Nations. Um, it's about the right of a people that, uh, you know, live in a territory in southeast, southwestern Europe that are expressing their will to organize a new state. Also, this, this discussion comes from, from the point that Spain doesn't recognize Catalonia as a nation, and therefore uh, there is no right of self-determination for a nation which doesn't exist. So in a way, we have to sell uh, or explain why Catalonia is a nation. So in this, like, after these three years of forced, forced exile that you have had, have you identified any change in the international political opinion when it comes to the Catalan issue? It's hard to tell, you know, from my individual experience whether I have identified a change. Uh, uh, what I have identified is that once people take the energy and the time to listen to us, uh, it's very hard to have uh, for them to, you know, to argue that. Uh, uh, that this is not something that needs to be respected and that needs to be worked out. Uh, uh, of course, uh, in politics, in international politics, well, the important thing are not uh, rights or desires, it's interests. And most of the political actors are, you know, have interests and therefore have uh, an a priori uh, position or fear of expressing positions against the status quo. And therefore it's very, very hard to break through this, uh, this position of respect to the status quo. Um, are things getting better? Uh, I don't know, honestly. I mean, there are occasions there are, and I think, you know, uh, the more active uh, our movement is, the more the, the more active, the more visible it is, the more opportunities we get to explain our cause. And recently we haven't had that many opportunities because things in Catalonia are quiet. Uh, so as long as we stay quiet in, you know, in the territory, uh, there is not much uh, need from the part of the political actors to respond. And if there is no need to respond, there is no need to question what's going on. There is no need to seek arguments. So it's difficult to find, you know, this book. If, uh, you know, if Catalonia gets back in the news, it will be time to, you know, issue this book or write another one. I mean, I invite people to just write more books, come on. Uh, you know, if you look about any other topic, it is full of books and uh, we're, uh, we're not producing enough uh, material. Uh, so I would invite <laughs> to produce good books, good books. Okay, I'm not telling this is fantastic, but you know, be careful, be, you know, just write in English, write well. Sorry, now it's my professor that's coming out here. It's not my talk. Okay. <laughs> Um, lately, there are, there have been many, many sentences from international courts against the, Span the Spanish state and judiciary. Um, however, these sentences and the repeated reports from organizations like uh, the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention from the United Nations, the Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International News, uh, they don't seem to affect Spain's position in any international democracy index, such as the Economist, VDEM Institute. Why do you think is that? And, and do you think that us as Catalans abroad can do something to influence this? 
Okay, that's a very good question, and that's probably the answer to a question that you asked me a few at the beginning about what does my book miss? It misses this. Uh, that's very important because it's true that Spain is ignoring it, but it's also true that respectable Democrats across the world in powerful positions pay attention to these things. When you, when people know that Amnesty International has issued opinions about the political prisoners, when they know about the United uh, Nations working group on arbitrary detentions, uh, you know, there is still the European Court of Human Rights has still not uh, taken a position, but there will be decisions at the European uh, Court of Justice regarding the cases, our cases, and so on. These things are important in the views of the international community because it's not true that a normal democracy ignores these things. What defines a normal democracy is that these things matter. You know, Russia can ignore the United Nations or Amnesty International, and Spain is behaving like Russia. And you know, this is what really, you know, that you know, the 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 the, the litmus tests of whether you are part, whether your society is democratic or not, whether your political opinion is manipulated or created by independent uh, minds or not. I mean, it's these things. Uh, so this is this is really very important. We're not, uh, uh, let's, let's be honest, you know, the lack of democratic tradition and independent media and rigorous analysis to uh, political issues, that affects Spain. And as long as we're part of Spain, it affects Catalans as well. And we're, you know, we're weak and we don't value these things. And, uh, and we haven't, you know, we've been developing a strategy to value them, but it's still, we're behind. And I think that in that, in that uh, the international Catalan diaspora can play a fantastic role and uh, probably we need to to structure that more and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, your, it's your game, but I think that's very, very important. Yeah. Is there anything else special that you, you want to comment or shall we go to the questions as we have uh, quite a few questions in the chat? Uh, I'm sure I'm for forgetting many things. Uh, but uh, I think let's go to the questions. If you think I'm forgetting things, ask them. Yeah. OK, then we go to the questions. Yep. Yeah. hello. There are several questions uh, on the chat. I will start. Uh, we received some previously of this uh, meeting, uh, and now we have a few on the chat on YouTube. So I will uh, start uh, seeing a few of the chat. So the first one comes from Chevy and says, what is the biggest difficulty for the international audience to understand the pro-independence movement? Which is the most important misunderstanding that you have to confront when explaining the case of the Catalans? That the immense majority of our fellow you know, citizens of the world, they all belong to a state and they are comfortable with their passport that's the main that's the main the main problem and they don't you know it's very hard for them to put themselves in the shoes of someone who has uh, you know uh, who's a, the citizen of a country and feels a member of a different nation that is I think that the most difficult part and in general most of these people, are not special are not they feel they think they are not specially nationalistic they think they you know this banal nationalism it has a name in the academia right you know they have their passport they are okay some of them the most sophisticated ones have several passports right in academia it's very common people who have of you know privileged uh, cosmopolitan background if they can they have several passports they know that passports are useful and it's useful to have several so uh but it's very hard for them to understand 
that we have one that we don't like, that it has been imposed on us, that it's not our choice. Because most of the people, don't, it's true, most of the people in the world don't choose their passport, right? They say, oh, I have this mind and I live with that and that's not a big problem. So I think this is, from the psychological point of view, breaking through that, it's very, very difficult. And, you know, telling people that, well, we're a historical nation, we didn't choose to be Spanish. Oh, yes, but it was 300 years ago. Come on, you've been Spanish forever, you know. Yes, but it has never worked out, you know, in a voluntary way. And then you can, you, can, you know, you, what's, the, what's the strategy? I don't know. I mean, there are many strategies, but, you know, for example, explaining what a federal state is. Okay, now we imagine in, you know, you know, in the United States or in Switzerland or in, even in Germany, you know, that the federal arrangement was not federal. Because Spain is not a federation. You know, that is, it's not a, an agreement of equals. Or even, you know, even if it's not an agreement of equals, there is no institutional arrangement, not one, and there was not from the very beginning, to make sure that the minorities, that the territories, Big or, big or small, but of course, the, the smaller ones, the smaller ones are, are always the, the, problem, the, the ones that suffer. They have no tools to defend themselves from abuse. And there is no, you know, there is no neutral referee in Switzerland. I don't, I'm not an expert about Swiss, the Swiss constitution, but, you know, I'm pretty sure there is a very, you know, elaborate and uh, you know, many tools to make sure that, uh, I don't know what's the smallest canton, but whatever is the smallest one, they have a lot of guarantees. And there is, you know, the Geneva, who's big, cannot go and, you know, take... Uh, okay, so so I think this, that helps to, under, at least in peop for people who live in federations, that, you know, that gives you the US, it's big, Germany, it's also big, Switzerland, it's small, but it's very important, you know, and there are others. So, you know, you say, well, because the argument is, well, if Catalans are different, well, they have self-government. Not true, not anymore. We do not have self-government. We had, we you know, we tried to construct it, but eventually we hit the wall and it's over. And now we have, you know, certainly we do not have, I mean, sorry, but it's, uh, it's a joke, okay? So I think this is the main uh, the main difficulty. But it's true that and we have to recognize this difficulty, and you know face it with uh, honesty, you know, and um, and then you and then you know then you get the criticism of nationalism. I think we should also be sort of uh, honest about the criticism of nationalism because you know what's what uh, there is many kinds of nationalism and accepting that we need to be careful about nationalism is ridiculous because there are, you know, there are nationalism that have been very progressive, uh, very liberal, very democratic, and then there are nationalists that have been um, fascist and uh, terrible. And, but usually these are the nationalisms that are linked to, you know, imperialism or frustrated imperialism, like Spain. And so distinguishing with, with, between nationalisms is important. And, you know, uh, people loving their country, that's something that's respectable all over the place. And why is it not respectable for us? You know, we're a nation, we have a right. The fact that it has been denied for centuries doesn't make it less of a right. Sorry, <laughs> but there was a big No, it's good, it's good, yeah. The next question is uh, kind of related. So it is, it says, which is the easiest to understand and the strongest argument in favor of the independence of Catalonia that you have identified when exposing the Catalan case to the international audience? Okay, my simplest argument right now is that, uh, because we did a referendum, people are in prison. 
you know, why? I mean, if, if you know, if there is, uh, you know, if, if to keep uh, the unity in Spain, you have to put people in prison, you have to uh, act, uh, you know, go and hit people when, you know, so there is nothing as harmless, right? As, you know, taking a piece of paper and putting it inside a plastic box. That's, you know, who can be hurt by that? But anyway, Spain needed to repress that violently, you know. Uh, so I think that's, you know, that's the main, uh, to me, at this point, that's the main argument because it's, you know, because uh, we have a right, we want to, of course, we don't want to impose it, of course not. We have a right to decide it democratically. If the majority of people who live in Catalonia decide that that's not what they want, well, I'll be sad, but I'll accept it. So if I can be sad by accepting, how come the other side cannot do the same? Why are they in need of violence, in need of abusing uh, justice, breaking the rule of law, because they have broken the rule of law. It's, it's very, very clear. There is no discussion. They've, you know, their repression is illegal in Spanish standards. But anyway, I don't think there is a unique or best argument. I think there is a, you know, a, Plethora of arguments. You know, the, our problem is that we have too many arguments, probably. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, in connection with this, in Switzerland, uh, people is really used to have a referendum every month for any kind of question and the direct democracy. So this in Switzerland, when uh, they saw the the voters being uh, repressed just for putting a ballot in a ballot box, it was shocking. So it's a good argument, I think, also for us in Switzerland. But in other countries where are more used to the not uh, the traditional partisan uh, democracy, it's a bit more difficult, I think. I agree. Uh, but I think that, you know, the argument that, uh, well, there is, this is a problem. It needs to be uh, resolved by people sitting and talking and, um, you know, voting. I mean, there is no other way to resolve conflicts that is uh, civilized. Everything else is violence. Of course, the history uh, of humanity is mostly the history of violence. But, uh, you know, now once that you have a country that uh, comes up and says, hey, please, can we be... Uh, uh, you know, a state and we'll do it, you know, democratically and peacefully and, you know, um, just, uh, um, well, that's an interesting experiment that, uh, you know, that uh, the international community could observe, uh, you know, uh, in a positive way. Okay, I'm being, I'm, I'm being ironic and I don't want to, you uh, um, um, and that, and this combination of ironic and naive may not be quite uh, effective, but uh, you know, it's uh, uh, at the end. At the end of the day, you know, the international listener uh, has maybe someone very pragmatic and very um, realist, which is something that happens. People say, "Okay, yes, democracy," but uh, uh, no. Uh, please don't bother us. We have other things to do. And when you find, uh, when you face someone like that, it's not a matter of convincing them. Then the issue is, well, you know, can we be sufficiently a political problem so that they need to think about it and pressure, you know, the violent side to stop the abuse. And of course, that requires us being a problem. I'm sorry. And I don't need to elaborate uh, right now and today what being a problem is, but certainly uh, sitting and you know writing letters and uh, saying please uh, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't convince anyone that uh, they need to move their asses.
Yeah, in connection of this, we received by email another question that did say, do you think that the European Union will end up in a situation with Spain like the one they are facing now with the Hungary and Poland? Or the double standards of the European politicians will prevent this? I'm not sure I, I didn't quite hear the question. Was it Hungary and Poland? Hungary and Poland, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, not, I don't think in the short term we'll, uh, we're not going to be a different, uh, not going to be seeing much in the short term. However, I think that using the, the comparison, uh, the double standard argument uh, is something that uh, eventually could uh, have some, uh, some effect. Uh, because, I mean, of course, uh, you know, Germany, uh, I mean, I don't want to get specific, but, uh, you know, they may be very critical of uh, Hungary, of Poland, but they are also, you know, it's, 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 it's mixed, right? Because they want to have their gas and they have to be friendly with the Russians, but not. I mean, geopolitics is very complex. Uh, right now, the majority in the European status quo uh, is not in control of the more extremist, extreme right governments in Hungary and, uh, and Poland, but up until very recently, Orban was part of the mainstream. Who knows how this will change? So there is a lot of internal politics also in the you know, in this, uh, this I, I, would, I don't want to call it, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find the word, but for example, the socialist, the, so, the Spanish socialist in the European Parliament, they are the champions of criticizing Poland and Hungary. The champions, the total champions. And, you know, they have no shame of being totally inconsistent, totally inconsistent they are. Uh, so, Eventually, this, you know, you can do that when it's over the world. So eventually, you know, if that starts to having, you know, economic impacts and has costs and, uh, uh, of course, getting support for these kind of things uh, is going to be, uh, everything has to be paid. I mean, and then all the talk, uh, all the public talk is one thing, the other is what happens. Uh, behind uh, the walls, uh, we don't we don't know what kind of pressures uh, the Spanish uh, establishment is subject to. I mean, um, we're only suspecting that there is going to be uh, they are going to be paying uh, heavily to get uh, the, 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 the 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 pandemic funds, and they are mostly going to be uh, asked to do you know. Uh, reforms uh, that are to the satisfaction of the, of the Brussels uh, status quo, but uh, we'll see. So at least, I mean, the least we can do is to point out that there is a huge inconsistency here. And, you know, after politics is uh, not what I used to do, in which being original was very important. Uh, in politics, it's not being original. What matters is being insistent. In connection with this, we have a question in the chat from Jose Garcia, which says that how has the result of the request to, wa to waiver your immunity as a, a member of the European Parliament shape or affect the view about the Spanish state, having so many uh, maps voting against it? Maybe it's connected? See, uh, uh, I mean, we lost the vote. Hey. I mean, let's, let's face it, we lost the vote. Uh, and it's such an obvious thing that, you know, that was wrong. You know, if you look at it from just try to, I know that I cannot get out of my own, uh, you know, situation, but, you know, it's, you know, it's a state politically prosecuting three MEPs that, you know, once they are immunity striped to put them in prison. That's, you know, it's, it's hardcore authoritarianism. Hardcore. And nevertheless, you know, 
A majority of our colleagues had no problem with that. Okay, it, uh, I don't want to be negative because, uh, you know, a good fraction, which was not a majority, had a problem with that. And that's something because Spain is one of the big countries and, you know, sort of uh, bringing up a discussion about this is a major, it, you know, it's a major um, you know, uh, affection, in, you know, uh, it's a measure of movement in the, you know, very stable situation in which, you know, we're all Democrats here, only the Eastern guys are not so good, but hey, all the West is good, right? Well, I mean, it's a good opportunity for them to look again. Well, yes, you know, you invited Southern Europe into, uh, into the Union, you brought in, you know, Greece, Portugal, and Spain. Well, they are three different cases, and they are very different, you know. Uh, authoritarian dictatorships were defeated in Portugal and Greece. They were not defeated. It was not defeated in Spain, you know. Franco died in bed, decided that this was going to be a monarchy. The appointed monarchy became a democratic uh, king. And now we see, you know, how he managed his tenure, how he, you know, he was at the peak of a mountain of corruption and the whole state was, you know, the evolving along, you know, this pile of manure. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's important that we had an, an opportunity to get this discussion and it's important that, you know, well, you know, a number of people listened and those that listened and, you know, basically who did vote for our, uh, to leave family money, who, well, you know, the members of the big parties that obeyed the official line. But there was uh, an important number of people that uh, that broke the discipline. Uh, many of them, you know, secretly, uh, because you know, being a member of the European Parliament, how do you get to be a member of the European Parliament? I mean, it's not I mean, our case; would a bit different, you know. But uh, in general, well, you're a member of the party. You've been, you know, brought to to be there. You have to. You want to stay because it's a nice uh, position. Uh, so, you know, you don't want to get into trouble with your bosses. And, you know, the Spanish uh, have very important positions in the big parties, in the popular party, in the, and in the socialist party, they are very powerful. Uh, so, anyway, so, yes, we're making some progress on that, on that front. Yeah. A good news that we are making some progress as well. We have an interesting question also in the chat from uh, Willie Brown. It says, I will, uh, as a German, I look more objectively at the case of the Catalans. Internation internationalizing the, the, the case is good, but how do you reach the daughters in Catalonia for independence? Do you need these people to write? Well, we need a majority and we have it. That said, of course, the more people we persuade the better, of course, of course. But, you know, I think that we have to take the approach that decisions by, uh, you know, by collective uh, are taken by a majority. And uh, we, we, we need a majority and we have the right to have this decision in an orderly and peaceful way. We really don't know what is the fraction of Catalans that would be happy to have, uh, you know, to vote yes under a, a referendum that was voted without, uh, you know, the threat of if you vote for independence, you know, uh, your life will be miserable, which is the approach that has uh, 
that Spain, well, Spain has not reached that point yet. I mean, it, I would be happy to have a referendum in which Spain accepts that it's a referendum, and then they threaten you, you know, with we'll take, you know, all the money, we, whatever, right? So uh, along the lines of the, how the discussion was uh, raised in the first Scottish referendum, there was a bit of threats, not much, it was mostly promises. Right. If you stay, you, they have not uh, respected the promises, and that's why you know a bigger fraction of the Scottish uh, voters seem to be inclined for independence. Now, not only they did not satisfy the promises, moreover, they forced Brexit, and they did not respect the institutions, the Scottish institutions, in the negotiation for Brexit and so on. But anyway. So yes, of course. I mean, it would be one if it would be wonderful to have uh, support for independent parties of seventy or eighty percent, of course. And uh, I'm very, uh, you know, I have no problem in in thinking of strategies for that. Of course not. Uh, what I think is bad is to think that to get more supports for independence, you have to sort of retreat or hide your agenda, or for example, or not used your, what is your, you know, basic uh, Catalan identity trait, which is the Catalan language. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the language of uh, the country. Um, you know, we can speak other languages, uh, you know, we can be quite flexible and liberal, but uh, trying to hide that that is our language would, is quite uh, ridiculous and accepting the threatening or the, the abusive uh, discourse of the Spanish nationalism. Of, you know, and, and that's something that's uh, unfortunately, I think uh, I've seen uh, this is, you know, gaining uh, gaining terrain in the political discussion, and I think that's really uh, that's bad. But anyway, at the end of the day, you know, it's fifty percent plus one, and I would accept being defeated, no problem. I just want the other side to play the same. Also, the same uh, person asked what I can do as a German to internationalize in the case of the Catalan, which is kind of linked at uh, what we can do as a Catalans abroad. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, what can you do? I think that denouncing the authoritarian abuses, that's the main thing. Uh, you know, there is, uh, it's, I don't think there is, one could have arguments on the, along the lines well, you know, if Catalonia was an independent country, there would be this or that benefit. I could come up with a list of things. Uh, we would be more productive. Another small country is always better. There are all kinds of general theories, right? Uh, uh, Catalans are very entrepreneurial and they're, you know, their potential is being uh, contained by being in Spain. So if you liberate this energy, that's going to be good for everybody. Okay, so these are arg positive arguments to say, well, you know, another country in Southern Europe that has, a, you know, that would be clearly a very democratic and liberal and uh, uh, at the same time entrepreneurial and, you know, inclined to more, uh, more welfare, that's, uh, that's good. Uh, but I think that the main thing that people can do is to, you know, know, uh, to, to have the, the data of the failures of democracy and explain them. I think that's, uh, and, you know, make the point that uh, whether we like it or not, the, as the prospect of having this other state in, the, in Southern Europe, there is, it's clear that there is a demand, that this demand needs to be managed. It's not a marginal, it's no, it's not, you know, a marginal fraction of the population that are making a crazy demand. You know, you could have made the point that that was the case 30 years ago, but there was no discussion. I mean, I, at this point, I recognize the value of people that 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 
when they were, you know, a minority against all odds, were still keeping the uh, the independence uh, as a as a goal. But okay, it, 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 what is true right now is that this is a mainstream in the Catalan in in in, in Catalonia, the region of Spain, in that place. It's a mainstream political agenda. It's mainstream. And therefore, it needs, uh, you know, it has to be addressed. And it's not going to go away. That's the other way to look at it. You know, this is, you know, this problem, you're not going to solve the problem by thinking that you've put up the fire. The fire is not going to be put up. Uh, you know, it's been, you can say, at least 300 years. Uh, it comes and goes, but it's there. But what is true, what is new this time, is that the agenda is independence. Because since, you know, since 14, uh, since 1714, Catalans have gone up and down in their claims, in their political will to have uh, self-government or to reform Spain or have this or that. But it was never explicitly uh, uh, argued, uh, you know, the narrative was never, let's get out of Spain. It wasn't. It, uh, it's taken us quite a while uh, for the majority or for, you know, a large fraction, you know, something that is, right now it's the majority of the electorate in the left, in the left direction. It has taken a while to say to say the words we want out. But once you reach that conclusion, I mean, hey, it's it's like divorce in a, you know, again the family analogies, you know, once one of the parties say I am out. Okay, well, yes, there is violence, there is all kinds of abuses in life. But is you know, if Spain and it's Spain. Um, okay, that's fine with them, but for the international uh, audience that looks at us, at us, well, you know, they've said we want out. And that's not going to go away. Uh, you know, uh, and, you know, well, well, yes, we could think of a catastrophic uh, scenario of annihilation, but uh, I don't think that's in the cards. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, one, long, one last question because we are reaching the end of the session. Uh, they put it on the chat uh, from uh, DBDDE. So it says that from a game theory perspective, being a specialist as you are on that, what are the actions that will, uh, would allow us to move faster towards the independence of Catalonia in your opinion? Uh, uh, fastest. Uh. I mean, I don't think that, I mean, the honest answer to that question is, I don't know, I think. I mean, as a, I don't think it would be pretentious to give an answer as a game theorist to a political problem that is a huge uh, collective uh, uh, problem that we're in a, in a political moment in which we're seriously uh, confused about what we should do next. So I think that's uh, the honest answer is we don't know. We, and I subscribe to this uh, collective state of mind. Uh, but what I could tell is a few things that we could do to try to get back on track. Uh, and I think that the first thing that we need to do to try to get back on track, and you know, things can be very fast or very slow. And I don't think it's, you know, neither speed should be the reason why we do things or not do things, nor we should just say, well, calm, take, you know, no, we need time. And that become the excuse of not doing anything. Uh, but I mean, to get back on track, I think we should, you know, recognize what we did up until 2017 and accept that we did not uh, seize the moment, that we had a fantastic opportunity in 
right after the referendum, but because because our political organizations and civic organizations uh, were not uh, prepared or whatever, we, our leadership was un, in, incapable of using the opportunity that we created. And that was not used and therefore uh, there it is, it's going to remain in history, but uh, the power that, uh, that that day created uh, has, uh, is no longer power in terms of energy that we could use. So we need to, you know, we need to get back uh, to creating uh, new opportunities. But I think it's important that uh, once we accept that, uh, and, and why have we not uh, used that power? Well, because repression was effective and repression was effective at very low intensity, honestly, okay? I don't want to dismiss or, you know, uh, the value of the sacrifice that some people have done, but just put it in historical comparative terms, you know? A dozen people uh, spending time in jail in okay, I don't want to okay, I don't want to elaborate, but you know, the cost has not been a few people in exile, okay? We've been away from home, that's hard, but I mean it's a few of us. And the conclusion after that was okay, no one else, no one else in prison, no one else in exile, okay. Sorry, if I have to give a message is as long as the strategy is a strategy in which oh, we don't do it if it has this kind of costs. Sorry, if that's what the majority of the Catalans that support independence think, they may as well give it up. That's uh, my view is that it's going to take sacrifices and, you know, pretending that, okay, the sacrifices are gone and now we'll do something else. Sorry, uh, no, that's not it. How it works? It uh, you know it requires more um, more effort, and, and and the fact is that the leadership of the independentism has been the one saying no, 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 no more, no more costs. Some you know this message we've received it from inside uh, the prisons. Our political prisoners are being kept in prison by the Catalan government that calls itself independentist. I mean, this is, uh, this is also hardcore surrealism, eh? So the other thing we need to do is to stop surrealism. You know, just say things straight for what God's sake. Okay, if we accept that political prisoners remain in prison, and are kept in prison by a government that we call our government. Okay, then tell the Catalan people that independence is not in the cards for that government. Because for some reason that government thinks that, you know, using the keys to the prison is not something that they want to do. Well, you know, uh, setting up a new country being independent is using that key to the prison and many more, but at least that one, it's a good start. But we're not doing, we're not seeing thing, this. Anybody who listens to this, uh, probably will be very few people will say, will tell the status quo of Catalan politics, who say Catal Clara is crazy because she's saying that. But sorry. As long as the majority of the Catalan leadership thinks in these surreal terms, we're, we're in trouble. And uh, well, we'll see. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist by heart, and I think that you know we'll get over surrealism sometime. I don't ask me when it will come, uh, but at least we should, you know, we should uh, be intellectually honest and call things by their name, um, uh, you know. There is no independence without sacrifice. And the sacrifice that we have endured, and I say it 
uh, with, I mean, if, if being in exile gives me some political authority, I use it. The sacrifice that we have in the is very, very low. And if we're not ready to pay more costs, well, then maybe, you know, that probably means that we don't, desi we don't need it or we don't desire or we don't want it enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's okay. If it has to be for free, okay, fine. It's true that if it's for free, it has more support. If it's not for free, it has less support. Maybe it doesn't have enough support. That's another one. Okay. But it, it, it would be a good to at least to, to clear the air about what is it that we want and what is it that we don't want. So uh, we are reaching really the end of the session. There are more questions, but I think I, I will pass uh, the word to Mireya because uh, we don't have uh, much more time. Thank you for answering all the questions, Clara. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Um, okay, so maybe as a wrap-up um, question, I would um, I would ask you something something else. Maybe in our in our path forward as a like the path forward of, of the process of independence for Catalonia. How do you think uh, the case of the Catalans will end? Will it be assimilation within Spain or independence? In case of independence. Uh, do you think it would be an unilateral secession without international recognition for many years as Taiwan? Uh, or independence with broad international recognition due to the remedial only secession option? Or independence through referendum with enforced majority as Montenegro imposed onto Spain uh, by international pre um, pressure? Or maybe uh, by a referendum uh, with Spain? Okay, the question was so long that I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry, it's just what are your thoughts? Uh, what do you think that, uh, yeah. how will no, it end? No, no, okay. Um, I mean, well, I don't have, a, you know, uh, a glass ball to tell you what the future bring, will bring. And, for, you know, you gave a several, a list of options in terms of how uh, Catalonia could become independent. Um, I think that any of them, any of them, you know, uh, are better than assimilation. Uh, so I would subscribe to any of them. Um, I, I, um, I feel that if we eventually uh, become uh, an independent country, it will be because of an, an, an uh, unilateral uh, declaration of independence. I am very skeptical of uh, Spain uh, sitting on a table before we're independent to talk about anything relevant. Uh, but I don't, honestly, I cannot um, roll out a simulation. I cannot. Uh, because uh, we, our political act uh, right now is um, uh, moving towards assimilation more than towards uh, independence. So we'll see. Uh, this is a little bit contradictory with what I say that this is not going to go away. Um, but hey, um, it's true that uh, you know the political tempos are uh, are very difficult to assess because at this point I don't see you know a political leadership capable of uh, moving into the direction of independence. Uh, and therefore, if we're not moving in the direction of independence, we're receiving, and if we're receiving, well, you know, eventually we'll get assimilated. But of course, things uh, you know move back and forth uh, in history uh, in many ways. Uh, so what I don't see is uh, Spain evolving in a way to resolve the Catalan issue that is not, in, that is not uh, assimilation. Uh, and therefore, uh, that means that eventually we'll uh, uh, have to either give up or uh, 
progress into a unilateral independence. What the reaction of that uh, of the international community would be to that? It would depend very much on you know what the conditions in which we reach that. Uh, but you know. Uh, when uh, if the discussion is well we don't want to be like Taiwan hey hmm, wow I would love to be like Taiwan honestly I mean we're not in the same geopolitical situation of course we're not in the Sea of China uh, and therefore I doubt you know I see our pos a possible future more linked to with the other, you know, to a situation in which, uh, you know, there is progressive recognition with conflict and negotiation and, uh, but uh, what would be the cost of uh, not being recognized and staying in the outside, uh, you know, in this limbo kind of situation? Well, I mean, of course, this cost the end. I can understand people that don't want to subscribe to that, but of course, given my uh, experience and my uh, definite will not to be a Spaniard, I'm ready to, to endure uh, whatever that takes. But of course, you know, that's, a, that's a collective discussion and we need to, we need to, to have this uh, conversation. Thank you, Clara. I, I do hope that the Catalan people do not give up. Um, thank you for, for being here with us and thank you for answering all the questions. As a side note, I want to let you know that you have some fans of your podcast, Parla Clara, in the chat, and they highly recommend it for all Catalan speakers. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Just thank you, you very know. much. And thank you again for, for being here. We are very pleased uh, as a uh, National Catalan Assembly in Switzerland. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure, and I hope I can, you know, come and see you in person once this uh, pandemic uh, bother uh, is over. We're all uh, looking forward to meeting uh, all, all the new friends we've making through the many months of uh, screens and screens, and eventually we can uh, be all in the same room. So thank you very much. We, we definitely look forward on, of, on seeing you here in Switzerland, finally visiting us. And just as a reminder, let you know that next week we still have one session uh, of this series of book presentation. It will be on um, Tuesday also at seven o'clock in the evening. Thank you very much everyone for attending. Bye-bye, thank you.